Uh, welcome everyone to our Impact Insights webinar series. Thank you for your patience. And we're very excited to have our speaker here today, Joe Matthew. But before we get started, Dean Dale Smith will be welcoming everyone and here she goes. Thanks, Dola. Thank you all for joining the College of Business Administration at LMU for our new series, Impact Insights, in a business landscape fundamentally changing as the result of the COVID pandemic. We are dedicated here in the CBA to bringing you valuable insights with impact and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and extending our impact regionally, nationally, and globally. This series is very much aligned with our mission of advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. This past Tuesday, we kicked off this program with our first webinar on entrepreneurial strategies for small business. And the series continues today with a wonderful partner from Deloitte, helping us understand how the CARES Act can be used to improve cash flow. As the summer continues, we'll hear from our faculty, industry partners, alumni, and thought leaders speaking to a wide range of issues critical to explore in this new renaissance from thinking entrepreneurially, marketing for growth, inclusive leadership, the topics are varied and the views are diverse. We encourage you to reach out to us, share your needs as we curate the content that will most help our region and our many community stakeholders. Again, thank you all for joining us as we engage together, sharing the knowledge, skills, and abilities that will lead to a successful rebirth in a recovering community. Through this intimate dialogue and a commitment to build bridges among us, we're really enthusiastic to live our mission at CBA and in the spirit of our Jesuit roots to be men and women for and with others. So please join me in welcoming our Senior Director for Business Development and Strategy, Nola Wanta, who will introduce today's thought leader. Nola? Thank you so much, Dale. Um, but before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to provide um, our webinar and community guidelines. Um, I'd recommend that you set your Zoom speaker to speaker view. Um, during the presentation, I have a colleague with me here, uh, Noriko Satoward, who will be helping to moderate questions. Um, please feel free to type your questions to the, in the chat window to the panelist. Um, you might also type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. Um, we will also leave time for an interactive Q&A where um, you should have a raise hand button towards the bottom of the screen, and we will unmute you and allow you to speak. Once unmuted, you may turn on your video if you, if you prefer. And just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available and the PowerPoint slide and presentation will also be available on our website. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce Joseph Malfi. He is a partner at Deloitte Tax. Uh, he is responsible for the overall strategic partner and managing director of acquisitions for the US tax practice. He's a CPA and has a master's degree in taxation. So needless to say, he is an expert in tax. Um, and I think that he'll provide us with some great insights on how small businesses can use tax planning to generate cash. So with that, Joe, please take it away. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Nola. And thank you uh, also, Dale. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to spend some time with, uh, with all of you today. Um, I, I really have uh, two pretty simple objectives today. Um, I, I think the first thing that I'm hopeful to accomplish is um, I want to provide all of you with, with really a high level overview of the, um, of the more salient tax aspects uh, that are contained in the CARES Act. Um, so I want to review the more important provisions with you. There are probably a half a dozen really important topics um, that I want to um, articulate today. Um, and then secondly, I am hopeful to kind of give you all a perspective that um, your prior year tax returns um, and your prior taxes paid, um, they may be a potential source of liquidity as you move forward in the, the, uh, it, with your business. Um, and so, so with that, I want to just mention, I'm going to uh, reference two particular areas on the, the, the slide that, that appears on your screen. There's a, a domestic column and then there's a compensation and benefits column. Um, so let me just share just a, a, a briefly a little bit of what each of these represents. The, the, the domestic column um, outlines the, um, 
the tax planning ideas uh, that, that are contained in the CARES Act. Um, they affect your federal income tax posture. And the compensation and benefits is primarily a payroll tax um, driven dialogue that we'll have here uh, this morning that focuses in on payroll tax. So we have two, two pieces to the presentation, legislation that's re related to your federal income tax position as a company and one that affects your, your, your payroll taxes. Um, so so let, let's take a step back for a moment, just, just frame what the subject is. Of course, the CARES Act, um, you know, that, that, that stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic um, Security Act. That, that was signed into law in late March of 2020. Um, probably the most well-known and the most popular provision uh, within that is, is, is what was referred to as this Section 1102 provision, and that is the PPP. I'm sure all of you have heard about the Payroll Protection Program. That's the most prominent element of the bill, uh, of that tax legislation. So many of you presumably have applied for that SBA loan and hopefully have received it. Um, and that is essentially a 1%, you're, you're borrowing money at a very low 1% interest rate. And to the extent that you use the money as the government would like, um, it's potentially a forgivable note, right? And so um, uh, that, that was the PPP. The, 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 the cliff notes on the PPP was that uh, the original CARES Act, when enacted, indicated that you could have your loan waived or forgiven if you spent 75% of the money um, on payroll costs. Of course, the whole point of the CARES Act is to help employers preserve uh, jobs for employees. That's a, a major element of the, 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 the CARES Act to begin with. Um, uh, the, the balance of the money uh, was able to be spent on things like utilities and mortgage interest and, and even rent. But 75% needed to go toward um, payroll costs. In subsequent modifications to the CARES Act over the last few months, uh, that percentage has dipped to 60%. So um, uh, that's a, a, a nice taxpayer friendly reduction from 75 to 60, uh, still allowing you to qualify for uh, ultimate forgiveness. Um, so that's the most popular element of the CARES Act and the most well-known provision. Um, a quick point that to the extent that you haven't um, applied, you still have time to apply. Um, so uh, they're still accepting applications, of course, through your banker. Um, and uh, the date for that is June 30th. So there's a, uh, another 19 days to uh, apply if you've yet to do that. Um, but what I want to do is I want to talk about the items that are less well known that I think represent opportunities for you to have a dialogue with your CPA, to have a dialogue with your tax preparer, um, because ultimately, the re ultimately there are opportunities embedded in this conversation to amend tax returns and recover overpaid cash um, and overpaid taxes. Um, plus interest. Um, so let, let me get right to the kind of the, 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 the key things under the domestic um, category here, which is the, the federal income tax provisions. Um, so the, the, the first thing I want to highlight, I, was, I want to highlight the, the, the new five-year NOL carryback provision. Okay, so you, you may know that net operating losses, the, the old tax rule had been that you were unable to carry those losses back to a year when you had taxable income and recover overpaid taxes in the past through the use of an NOL carryback. Those, the net operating losses could only have been carried forward and could offset taxable income in the future. Well, of course, that doesn't quite help us as business owners now uh, with respect to our cash tax posture. Um, so the government included in this bill um, a, an ability to carry losses back for five years. 
So um, if you are a corporation, you have a net operating loss, either for 2018, 2019, or 2020, they can be carried back, those losses can be carried back um, to as far back as 2015 um, and recover uh, um, taxes and, with interest um, from prior years. So very, very significant provision that is um, available to uh, those with net operating losses um, and have taxable income in prior years. Now, I want to I want to make mention of uh, a, a pretty interesting little rate differential. So there is a, a tax rate arbitrage that comes with this, carrying a loss forward. Um, the, the corporate tax rate, as you may know, is 21 percent. That's the federal corporate tax rate. Um, prior years, it was 35 percent. So if you carried a loss forward, that's worth that's worth. 21% to a taxpayer, carrying it back is worth 35%. So you, you have a 14% rate arbitrage with a carry back. So for every million dollars of carry back, it's an additional 140,000 of cash uh, over and above what you're able to recover in, 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 in prior years just due to the rate differential. Um, so, so that's point one that I wanted you to kind of take away from the conversation is the importance of the new five-year NOL carryback provisions. Um, next, I want to highlight the business interest limitations. So you, you may know that the, the, the government, um, the IRS, loves to limit uh, a taxpayer's ability to deduct interest. That's just a theme with, um, within the tax law, whether it's home mortgage interest that is limited uh, as an itemized deduction, limited on your personal income tax return to a certain percentage of your adjusted gross income, whether it's investment interest expense that an individual incurs that's limited by your investment income, business interest, interest paid by a, a business, corporation, S-corp, LLC, partnership, um, there have been significant limitations on your ability to deduct interest. Um, the most common um, limitation is referred to as the 163J provision. That's just an internal revenue code section that indicated that interest was limited to 30% of your taxable income. That's all the interest that you as a business owner could deduct on your business tax return. So this CARES Act in, enhanced that limitation. Uh, I'm sorry, it, 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 it changed the 30% limit. It increased it to 50%. And so now businesses are entitled to deduct more interest than they otherwise had been as a result of the CARES Act. Um, I think it's important to note that this is a 2019 change. So you can go back and amend your 2019 tax return and claim additional interest deductions. Uh, recover overpaid taxes, um, uh, and it also applies to 2020. Um, interestingly, it, it does not, the 2019 rule does not apply to partnerships. Um, it applies to all other taxpayers, S corps, corporations, but it does not apply to partnerships. It just applies to partnerships in 2020. So that is a very meaningful amended tax return opportunity. Um, on your federal income tax return. Um, finally, within the, the federal uh, bucket here, I want to share, I want to touch on uh, a subject called qualified investment property. You'll see on the slides, uh, it's referred to as QIP. QIP, qualified investment property, this is nothing more than leasehold improvements. This is any improvement that a taxpayer is making to the interior portion of a building, a, a non-residential real property asset. So people who are making tenant improvements, leasehold improvements, almost every industry has qualified investment property, right? Whether you're a restaurant or a retailer or a, you know, commercial, you're, you're into commercial real estate or your professional services firm, um, uh, most businesses typically have leasehold improvements. The, the old rule had been that for tax depreciation purposes, those costs were recovered by over 39 years. You put a million dollars of leasehold improvements in place, 
you get to amortize or depreciate that over a 39 year life. So you would get a pretty nominal amount um, of, of, of depreciation deductions. Um, this act concludes that qualified in improvement property is now, now has a 15 year life for tax purposes. And the importance of that is that 15 year property is eligible for what they refer to as bonus depreciation. So all, imp all qualified improvement property, all costs incurred in a year are immediately expensed and deducted under the bonus depreciation rules, which apply to 15 year property, but did not apply to 39 year property. So again, what, what does that mean? You, you put a million dollars of leasehold improvements in place, you get a million dollar deduction um, as opposed to a million divided by 39, uh, which is, I don't know, 25,000. You'd get a $25,000 depreciation deduction under the old law. Now you get a million dollar deduction. Um, the beauty of this uh, kind of little known provision is that it's retroactive. This is retroactive to um, uh, 1 1 2018. So, um, to the extent that you have um, uh, qualified investment or improvement property and you incurred costs in 2018, 2019, and 2020, this too is a pretty meaningful uh, amended tax return opportunity. Um, and so again, just let me, I'm going to just take a breath and I'm going to pause for a moment. These are three federal ideas that are contained in the CARES Act that I think give all of you an opportunity to have a pretty healthy dialogue with your lawyer, your tax advisor, your tax preparer to say, how are these impacting my cash, cash tax posture? Do I have an opportunity to recover overpaid taxes in the past? Um, and in that discussion, in that analysis, um, uh, I think you should give more thought to things beyond these ideas. There's been other legislation that um, may, your CPA may have knowledge of. There may be other things to, um, to contemplate in an amended return. You may not just amend for one of these items you may have other items. So it's a really healthy time now to give thought to, hey, how much tax did I pay in the prior years? And do I have an ability to recompute my taxable income and recover overpaid taxes? So like I said, let me pause and um, Nola, I'll turn it to you to see if uh, there's a question or two that I might be able to, 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 to answer. Sure, we do have um, one question, actually it's from Dale. Um, would this be true QIP if your investments include rental property? For instance, we have residential rental property and our tenants are asking for a reduction in rent. Um, no, sadly, the answer is no to that. QIP um, is, is, is any improvement uh, to the, like I mentioned, the interior portion of a building, but that building needs to be non-residential real property non-residential real property is the focus of this provision. And uh, sadly, it does not um, touch on residential real property. Are there any other questions? And if there are, please feel free to raise your hand or type it in the chat area. Ah, we have another one from another Dale Vanderwood. Um, is there any guidance for how 1099 PPP loans will be forgiven? What evidence is required, et cetera? Yes, there is, there is guidance on, on this. And you know, I would say it is going to be very exact and precise. So these, 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 the guidance is very precise in terms of how the money needs to be paid and during what period of time there are certain calculations that need to be maintained. Um, I think there's a pretty high probability that most people will have some inquiry about this, meaning and some type of an audit. So I would you know, encourage people to, to, to keep you know, pretty um, exact notes and files on this. 
Um, but 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 I think um, what I what I would suggest is, and I please share my email address. I'm happy to share by email um, uh, kind of an overview of what um, you would need to pay you know pay attention to in order to you know enjoy the um, the, the the loan forgiveness. Um, it is involved. It is precise and exact as you would expect with you know um, with with uh, tax law and certainly with you know, uh, a loan to be, you know, forever forgiven. Um, uh, there, there are very specific rules to follow in order to have that forgiven. And I think it's best that I, I might be able to follow up directly one-on-one -on -one and uh, I can share what I know on that subject. Thanks, Joe. Are there any other questions before we move on? Uh, okay. Well, we'll pause again and- uh, Okay. Great. I'll let you know. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I want to kind of just shift the attention maybe to this, this green column here that talks about compensation and benefits. Um, and, 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 and as mentioned, included in, in that section, there is a discussion uh, under what you can do that talks about the provision 1102, and that, that is the, 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 the PPP. So that is the payroll um, protection program um, that's included in this compensation and benefits. That's that's the that's the primary provision in in the act. Um, but there are other um, less well known provisions that affect um, the subject of payroll taxes and and there is a, a there is a retention credit that I'd like to discuss. Um, uh, there is in addition to the PPP there is now an opportunity to defer the employer side of payroll tax, okay, specifically social security taxes. Um, and so uh, for the remainder of 2020. So there is no obligation to um, pay uh, the 6.2%, the, the employer side of social security. So you might, you might recall that um, Social Security taxes is 13.4%. It's 6.2% on the employee, 6.2% on the employer. Um, the, the CARES Act includes a provision that allows businesses to defer um, the remainder of 2020's payroll tax, the employer side of payroll tax, the 6.2% that you as an employer would pay um, you can defer the, what would be due for the balance of this year through December 31st, 2020, uh, and it doesn't need to be repaid until December 31st of 2021 and December 31st of 2022. So whatever you defer in 2020, it's payable, it's repayable back interest-free 50% on 1231. 2021 and 50% on December 31st, 2022. So that's a pretty meaningful cash preservation uh, type concept that was available to uh, most employers here in the, uh, in the CARES Act. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, there is a refundable employee retention credit. Okay. And so, uh, uh, hopefully you're all aware of, of this credit. The credit is nominal at the moment. Uh, it's $5,000 per employee. Um, and it, it, it is, it, it's focused on wages that you pay to your employees from March 12th to December 31st of 2020. So your payroll base during that period of time um, is eligible uh, for a credit to the tune of $5,000 per employee. Um, the, the, the credit is taken, and you will likely discuss this with your payroll tax provider. It's taken as an offset on your payroll tax returns. So if you had a payroll tax liability, you would claim this credit as a reduction of that payroll tax liability. To the extent that the credit wipes out the payroll tax liability, it's refundable to you in cash. Um, so again, another 
you know, little known source of liquidity that I would encourage um, all of you to evaluate um, with your payroll tax provider, your, your, your tax advisor. Um, interestingly, so you may know that the CARES Act was passed, as I mentioned, in March of 2020. There have been subsequent enhancements to it. There have been other uh, updates to it. So there have been two other um, uh, corrections to this bill. Um, and there is now a fourth one that just passed the House and is sitting with, with, with the Senate. Um, that's referred to as the HEROES Act. Now, the HEROES Act um, contains a provision uh, that would take this $5,000 credit per employee and make it a $36,000 number. Um, so I think the government is evaluating that the, the stimulus that was contained in the earlier versions of the CARES Act may not have been enough. Um, and so there, there are enhancements to um, uh, provide more um, stimulus to, um, to, to businesses. And this is one example. Now, whether or not it passes or not is, uh, um, you know, it, it's up for debate at the moment. Um, but the, the act does include that it has been passed by the House. Interestingly, just as a side note, that bill also contains a two-year reprieve for folks like us, individuals, on our individual tax returns. You may know that uh, as California residents, we had been limited under the, uh, the last Tax Reform Act um, in what we can deduct in state and local taxes, right? So we have a, you know, we, we are limited. State and local taxes, we're not able to get those deductions anymore as uh, on our federal return, and we're paying a, a lot of state and local taxes in a high tax state like California. Um, the HEROES Act contains a provision there that would allow individuals uh, a two year. Um, reinstitution of the old rule and allow individuals to deduct their state and local taxes in 2020 and 2021. That's just a, a side note. It's included in the bill just like this um, refundable employee retention credit is included at the $36,000 figure. So you might want to keep tabs on that because there's some good things in there should they be passed um, that will uh, you know, provide more liquidity to uh, you as, as, as business owners and, and possibly as individual taxpayers. Um, so let me, uh, let me just take another pause and uh, Nola, see if there are other um, inquiries or observations or questions from the audience. Sure. Um, does anybody have any questions? Again, feel free to type your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. And we're, we're also, uh, you're also welcome to raise your hand if you'd, if you'd like to speak with Joe. Any questions so far? Okay, no questions for now, so. Okay. Oh, oh. okay, um, so no questions. Uh, I was just informed that the raise hand function is off, so um, just please type, oh. Oh, it does work. Uh, perhaps it's just for Dale. Oh, okay, thank you, Patricia. <laughs> if you have a question, let me know and keep your hand up. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, so Joe, please yeah. go on. Yeah, great. And so, so what I wanted to do, guys, like I, like I said, I wanted to summarize, you know, a half a dozen provisions. You know, there is much more contained in the act. I think uh, I wanted to highlight some of the the, the two or three key federal tax uh, opportunities. Um, and I wanted to highlight the two or three top um, payroll tax opportunities. Um, but I, again, I would encourage you to have a broad dialogue with your tax preparer. I think it's really important that you look at, you know, do you have taxes that have been paid in prior years? It's just a very, very important time to scrub those returns um, and see if there are opportunities to uh, amend, reduce taxable income. Uh, you could accelerate deductions into prior years. You can defer income to future years. Um, that is really what most of our clients are doing right now. 
Um, there is a, a significant amount of amended tax return opportunity. There's a significant amount of NOL carryback claims being filed. Um, so that was the primary point of what I wanted to outline. I wanted to kind of keep it simple. I wanted to keep it 30,000 foot level, just in terms of the, the, the basics that are uh, more significant in the act. There are other things in there that you should kind of flush out with your, with your, your tax advisor. I, I'll, I'll just, I'll Lee, I want to just tell a brief little story just to kind of, kind of conclude the, 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 the conversation. Um, you know, I think it's a really important time to give thought to what your um, choice of entity is. And I want to kind of just share a quick observation on that um, and, and, and provide an example. And, and when I say choice of entity, I mean, uh, are you a C-Corp? Should you be a C-Corp? Are you an S-Corp? Are you an LLC? Are you a partnership? What is, what is your tax burden? Um, as a result of choosing to be in that, in, in that form of business entity. Um, because I see what we see, we see a lot of people by virtue of the fact that the tax rates, there's such a diversion in tax rates. Um, we have a number of uh, clients who are contemplating, have contemplated and have even implemented a change from being a pass-through entity as an S corporation to now becoming a C corporation. And I'm gonna just give you the, the, the Cliff Notes version on the, the, the tax arbitrage and the math associated with that. Um, so if, if, if I own as an individual an, a, a California S corporation and the, it earns $2 million a year in taxable income, I as the owner of that S corporation, I'm paying, I'm paying 37% federal taxes, which is the highest individual rate. And I'm paying 13.3%. It's the highest California individual income tax rate. So I'm paying 50.3% in federal income taxes as a result of being in the S corp structure. We've had a number of folks contemplate, should I be a C corporation, right? You might recall that at the end of 2017, we had a tax reform act. Um, uh, the tax reform act, um, uh, which is the first comprehensive tax reform bill that we've had since 1986, so well over 30 years, that reduced the corporate income tax rate to 21%. So the C corp rate is 21%. It came down from the 35. I had referenced that when we talked about the NOL carryback provisions. Um, so you're going to carry back you're going to carry back losses if you are eligible for the NOL carry back and you're going to recover 35% tax dollars, not 21%. Um, and so now we're in an environment where the corporate rate is 21%. Now, the, the reason for that change, it was debated among the various political parties. Um, you know, if we're going to have a comprehensive tax reform, are large corporations the type of people that need that type of stimulus? Going from 35 to 21, again, it was a pretty hot debate. Um, on one side, the thought was we were at 35%, one of the highest taxed countries in the world. When you look at other countries, Ireland is 12.5%, the UK is 19. Um, corporate tax rates are generally low outside the US. Um, 35 was particularly high, but now it's 21%. And the maximum rate for California corporations is 8.84. So if you were in a corporate form, you would be paying 21 plus 8.84. So you're going to be paying slightly less than 30% if those same $2 million of earnings are in a C corporation versus an S corporation. So you can see the 50.3 versus, you know, something in the high 20s, uh, pretty meaningful. So a number of our clients who are S corps um, have converted converted to a C corporation, you can convert back after a five year period of time. And there's a significant tax savings, of course, as I've just outlined with, with the basic math. Um, now it's involved, there's, there's many other things to consider, um, um, uh, but uh, it is an important, by virtue of the fact that the tax rates are so, there's such a big gap, it really is necessitating 
the marketplace clients are looking at, am I in the right form of entity? So I will just kind of leave you with that thought in addition to embracing the, um, the, the uh, significant items here in the CARES Act that hopefully will provide you an amended return opportunity and or an NOL carryback opportunity. I think it's also an important time to just reflect on the rates and include that in, 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 in a dialogue you would have with your, your tax advisor to, to consider it may be converting from one entity to another choice of entity, may be, may be more valuable than all of these items combined uh, in a big picture basis. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause again to see if there are any final observations or questions. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, anything that you'd like clarified, um, I'm happy to email direct to answer any uh, follow-up technical questions. Uh, all of these ideas have a whole host of um, language behind them, rules, et cetera, that are important to note. Um, uh, but um, know that you can contact me as you wish, and I'll just uh, take any final questions before, uh, before we call it a day. Um, no yeah, absolutely. So if, if anyone has any questions, this is the time where we can have an open dialogue. Um, this is where I think that we like to differentiate in our webinars is we love hearing from the audience in terms of your questions and you've got a tax expert here. Um, so please uh, feel free to raise your hand, type your questions in the Q&A, however you prefer. Um, this is our open dialogue time. So um, questions, anyone? Um, Joe, I'll, I'll kick it off. I, I have a question. Um, it was interesting to hear about you talking a little bit about the HEROES Act and where the HEROES Act is in terms of what's going on in DC. Um, obviously, that has a lot of implications for uh, personal tax returns. And I'm just curious, do you see other, uh, is Deloitte getting a sense of any other impetus that we may see other changes as, as people have had to take uh, you know, their personal circumstances are changing. Um, it's affecting so many uh, unemployment issues, furloughs, layoffs, all of these sorts of things. Do you think you'll see implications for tax policy and how it might move forward, particularly in an election year? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and uh, nobody really knows the answer to that. You're right, it is the most, the most salient aspect about that question is that it's in an election year. And so, um, you know, there was, it was very, the, the last tax reform bill that was the end of 17 was very, very contentious. Mm -hmm. um, and it was contentious um, uh, in, in, in a lot of key areas, um, not the least of which is the tax rates. And, and the tax rates for corporations, um, there's a view that they're already paying little to no taxes, you know, major multinational corporations, why do they need a 14% break? So I think that that's where the, I think that's what's going to happen with the next, you know, that's, that's, that's what everybody is kind of on pins and needles with right now. Um, would a change to a democratic, you know, uh, uh, to, to a, a democratic president um, and maybe changes in the House and the Senate, um, would that uh, be the impetus to undo some of the lower corporate rates that have been afforded to major corporations? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, individual rates. Um, there were a lot of people affected uh, by this, particularly in Democratic states, the New York, the New Jersey's, the Californias. We were all disproportionately affected by the changes in no state and local income tax deduction. Um, so very, very contentious subjects. Um, and uh, I, I think that there's a, a real wait and see now. Um, and, and there's an expectation that if there is a change in leadership, that there will be, this will be a, another debated subject and there might be, a, you know, an, another tax reform bill to potentially undo some of the, the, the graduated rate tables that drastically changed for the first time since literally 1986. Thanks. Yeah. See the other question.
we, we do have another question here. Um, most companies I know are experiencing major delays in EIDL funding requests and the Main Street lending program seems to be slow as well. Is there any near-term hope that these will begin to flow? It, uh, could, could you just clarify the question? I, I didn't, uh, the EIDL, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure that I hear that right. I don't know what that is. Is that the PPP or are we talking about or? Uh, SBA funding emergency. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the, that's the, yeah, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any improvements that are being made to that. You, you might know that this is an, ultimately this is an SBA. This is a bank issue, right? That's what the government would say. You're borrowing money from a particular bank. There are two or three very large ones that are the ones who are administering the PPP program. And, you know, I don't think anybody was really prepared for this structurally, technologically, and uh, there's been a you know a, a whole um, host of delays and challenges. Um, uh, I, I really think that it boils down to what I've observed in my client base: people who had great relationships with regional banks did great. You know, there are small banks that were swift and took really good care of their small business owner clients. Whereas if you're caught up in, you know, some of the big three banking world and you're a, uh, uh, you, you may not have the, the best clout or relationship with that bank, I think that there have been significant delays. That's just my perspective. That's just what I've learned kind of on the ground. Um, uh, but um, I think it depends on what size bank you're with is the answer to your question. Great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Are there any other questions someone raised or you're also welcome to raise your hand as I mentioned or type in the Q&A. Uh, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk and you are welcome to unmute yourself. Dr. Del Delante. Okay, so Scott Delante here. Joe, thanks for doing this today. Um, my question is around the PPP and the latest changes that um, I have a friend whose business borrowed more than what they looks looks like they can get forgiven. And at that rate, as they're adding up their payroll, looking at a couple of payroll decreases, the latest rounds of changes that relaxed some of the PPP requirements look like we can probably go beyond the initial eight week period to accumulate that payroll and kind of add up beyond eight weeks, even into the, the remainder of the year, perhaps. So that was part of my question. And then the other part was just in this latest round of relaxations, they, um, they put a cliff in that if you don't get to that 60% level you mentioned where 60% of the amount forgiven could be for pay, and then the other 40% could presumably be for um, utilities, maybe rent or interest. So for that, that cliff, I just thought you might wanna mention that for folks, that that was new, that it's, it's relaxed, yes. but it is a cliff. Yes, it is, I, that, that, that's exactly right. The, 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 the original um, bill contained, as you mentioned, it was 75% needed to go to payroll costs. Um, now that is now 60, as you mentioned. So that has been relaxed where there's a, a, a reduction in the amount that needs to go to uh, payroll in order to enjoy the uh, benefits of having uh, the, the, the note forgiven. And the, the balance, as you, as you point out now um, uh, correctly, is that uh, the, the balance of the 40% can go to um, utilities, rent, and mortgage interest to the extent that you have it. Um, and so, uh, uh, but I was not familiar with the view that you go going beyond the eight weeks. And so I, I'll have to uh, revisit my, my uh, I'll have to revisit the subject and, and maybe we can dialogue directly. I'm happy to help you help your colleague or friend with uh, the math and the details because it is 
it is involved and it's particularly if you had over borrowed based upon your your first wave of information that was contained in the application i'd actually love to look at the application and just kind okay. of get right down to the math with you so i'm happy to do that um, okay, Joe, directly yeah. and and help your uh, your your your, uh, your friend and your colleague well, I think you're clearing up with an ambiguity in, in the language that it might be you can just move your eight-week period to a different eight-week period. Yes, that's that's correct. That is accurate. That okay. is accurate. There's a, different, right. there's a different period to examine, and that's part of the nuances, and you're going to get a different answer depending upon what eight weeks you're looking at, but that is accurate what you're laying out uh, for okay. sure. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Scott. Uh... Any other questions? Again, feel free to use the Q&A to type your question or raise your hand and happy to unmute you and start a dialogue. Um, Scott, again, let me go ahead and allow you to talk. You can unmute. Um, okay, I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah. I was gonna let anyone else go and since they didn't, you intrigued me on something I was totally unaware of where the SALT, the state and local tax limit of $10,000 for federal. Um, so that's how, could you elaborate on how that might be opened up? Yes, I'd be happy to do that, Scott. Yeah, so that, like I mentioned, there, there is a, 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 another enhancement to the CARES Act and it's referred to as the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act um, has already passed the House. Um, you may have heard in the news that uh, I think it was the Senate that may have declared that it was dead on arrival, was the politics at the moment on, on the television. Um, and uh, because there was a sense that um, in an effort to help business and uh, to help the employment posture in the United States, uh, there was a sense that the House, you know, may have asked for more than they should have in what they passed. Of course, this is the the, the normal, uh, the, the the normal that we're all aware of in terms of the the debate between the House and the Senate. Um, but but the House has passed the Heroes Act. I mentioned that in that uh, the retention credit, uh, the employee retention credit, uh, which is refundable. Uh, currently 5,000, jumps substantially to 36,000 should that be passed. That, that's the language in, in the bill. It also contains a, um, a two-year reinstatement of the full SALT deduction. So the $10,000 limit that you're referencing would be aborted. And um, for 2020 and 2021, um, individual taxpayers would enjoy a full deduction of their state and local income taxes on their federal tax return. Um, now, uh, you know, when the Senate describes that as dead on arrival, um, you know, you, you, you can see the politics of this, right, with a, with, with, with a, the, you know, a Republican-controlled Senate, with a Republican in the, in the White House, um, uh, there is going to, I would guess that it's going to be less likely that that particular provision passes. If anything is going to be debated, I'm assuming that would be an item that would be debated. Because as I mentioned, the people who are most disadvantaged by that rule, um, Scott, are, you know, us on the phone in California residents, um, New York residents, mm -hmm. New Jersey residents. Um, I think there's one other state, and I can't remember what the fourth. Those are the three highest um, uh, state income tax rates in the country, right? So um, they happen to all be the three democratically controlled states. So, you know, if I had to guess, I would anticipate that that's a, a real wrestling match. Um, of course, I would hope that, you know, we would win that, uh, but it's not yet passed, but I do take a lot of comfort that, that it's in the bill and uh, the House passed it. Um, but whether it makes its way through the Senate um, is uh, kind of the next step. Um, so hopefully that clears it up a little bit more for you, Scott. Excellent. Thanks. I'll be curious to see what happens to our deficits. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. 
Yep. Oh, terrific. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, any other questions? Uh, uh, any, and again, you may type your questions in the Q&A um, or raise your hand. Joe, I'm just curious, because um, you had mentioned, I, I, I actually have a question. Um, you mentioned that you know small businesses and owners should talk to their CPAs and start a conversation. Um, do you think that more and more small businesses are looking at their various tax opportunities now, or are they seeking loans first? Like, what's the cash situation and generation from yeah. your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step was let me, you know, let me quickly apply for the PPP. You know, those dollars are meaningful. Uh, and uh, that was, there were deadlines driven around that um, where you had to have your application. And so I kind of view that as kind of phase one of the, how do I solve my liquidity challenge? Mm -hmm. And and what I've learned from my clients and what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis with ideas like what we've talked about now is, you know, we have, you know, our, our clients are now viewing, you know, the subject of taxes, um, the subject of uh, amending tax returns as a the second wave of potential cash liquidity opportunities. And so we recommend to all of our clients, if your tax return is open by statute, right? So there's a statute of limitations it's generally three years for federal income tax purposes. It's four for California, which means that when you file a return, um, the government can come audit it and challenge it um, within three years the date, from the date in which you filed it. Thereafter, the statute is closed and nobody can change what's in that tax return. The government can't audit you, nor can you go amend and say, hey, guess what? Um, I want to, um, you know, I want to uh, recalculate my tax depreciation because of the qualified improvement property rule, as an example, or, or any other rule. So, um, so, so there's a statute of limitations. We suggest uh, any client that has taxable income where they've paid cash taxes for federal and state purposes in any open year you should take a look at that. You should take a look at it. Um, revisit the major components of how you calculated taxable income. There have been a meaningful amount of credits that have been introduced into tax law. Can you enhance your research and R&D tax credit if you're claiming that? There's a whole host of credits that might be able to be enhanced if you're eligible for a certain type of credit. There are uh, you know, different tax accounting methods that you should contemplate. Um, uh, and so we're looking at, we're suggesting that not only do you embrace these ideas here, the CARES Act ideas, but pre-CARES Act, you know, there, like I said, the, there was major tax reform introduced in December of 2017. Um, first time since 1986, it was comprehensive tax reform like the country has never seen. And I would guess that many taxpayers have overpaid taxes in an open year and should be eligible to review uh, uh, and potentially are eligible for a refund. So I kind of view this, Nola, as kind of wave two of, mm -hmm. you know, potential doors to open that could assist in uh, the liquidity challenge that, that business folks have in this you know, COVID environment. That's great. I mean, based on what you said, it sounds like there's an opportunity for, for small businesses to also pivot based on some tax opportunities in terms of their activities, right, maybe? Sure. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's well said, Nola, thank you. Oh, great. Oh, great. A any other questions? comments. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. if there aren't any more questions, 
Um, I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today and for listening to our talk on how tax can be used to um, generate cash. And, and you know, based on Joe's last comment, it's, it sounds like there are opportunities for businesses to definitely evaluate their various activities. And I think that's fantastic. And I, you know, when we think about business renaissance, I think that that's one way to go, especially as we're looking at how several things are changing just in, in, in how we live and how we work. So um, I just want to remind everyone that next Tuesday, the June 16th, we will be having our um, next webinar as part of our series, and it's focused on marketing this time. Um, we're going to be looking at marketing challenges and opportunities in a post-COVID world, and it'll be with professors Andy Rahm and Ma Matt Steffel. And they'll also have a special guest, um, Eric Johnson, and he's the founder and president of Ignited Advertising. So we're looking forward to having you join us then. Um, for now, thank you, Joe, again, for yes. speaking to our audience. And Dean Smith, thank you as well. And we'll see you all next time. Bye.